All right, everyone, welcome to another iteration of A plus D Thursdays. My name is Shannon Jackson. Uh, I'm Associate Vice Chancellor for the Arts and Design here at Berkeley and Hadidi Professor of the Arts and Humanities. It's a privilege as always to welcome uh, students and community to this series. Um, as many of you know, this is a series created um, to focus on time-based media art um, inside of a larger course that exposes students at UC Berkeley to a range of artistic fields and venues on and off campus across the visual arts, performance, literature, um, and design. We're focused on the field of time-based media art, um, thanks especially to the generosity of the Kramlick Art Foundation, um, who has supported this entire course, this entire lecture series, um, and engagement around it. The Kramlick Art Foundation is committed to education, research, and public programming in the field of time-based media art, and we're grateful to them. Uh, I also uh, want to say that many of you know that we've been welcoming all throughout this series a range of internationally renowned artists and curators. Um, artists and curators such as Isaac Julian, uh, Mohel Modisi Kang, Rudolph Freeling, Stuart Comer, Shireen Nishat, Steve McQueen, Richard Moss, and more. I also wanna say that as international as, it, as this uh, series has been, we've all throughout been focused on um, wanting to reinforce the kind of curatorial work, exhibition work, artistic work that can be found on view at our Bay Area arts organization. So many of the artists you've met throughout the series can be found and featured at organizations like SFMOMA, um, Oakland Museum of California, McAvoy Foundation for the Arts, uh, the DeYoung Museum, BAM PFA, our own university art museum, and many more. Uh, so we have been always all throughout reinforcing the Bay Area's role in this field. And it is with that um, sense of um, connection that I'm particularly thrilled to um, introduce today's event. I'll say throughout that as much as we've been working with regional partners in, um, throughout in selecting the series, we uh, this program, this week's program and next week's program are the first programs that are also officially co-sponsored by another one of our regional arts institutions, uh, in this case, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. And with that in mind, I am particularly grateful um, uh, uh, for the work of Tanya Zimbardo and Tomoko Kanamitsu, who have worked together with SF Mom and together with A plus D staff, Paris Coates and Sumin Su, in creating what is actually today and next week uh, a true institutional collaboration. So huge thanks to Paris, Sumin, Tomoko, and Tanya uh, for this week and next week especially, and these two weeks especially. Um, it is also with that sense of regional commitment and the Bay Area's contribution to video art that I'm particularly thrilled to welcome you to today's event focused explicitly on the history and future of video art and time-based media art um, in the Bay Area. Uh, I welcome you to go online to make sure that you see the fuller biographies of the luminous individuals we have uh, here today. But I'll just uh, uh, remind you um, a bit about some of their extraordinary background. Tanya Zimbardo, who will be leading today's dialogue, is a San Francisco-based curator and assistant curator of media art at San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. She's co-curated many, many exhibitions all throughout the region and beyond the region and contributed and or co-edited numerous um, groundbreaking publications. Her current exhibition, Future Histories, The Astor Gates and Colleen Smith, is on view at SF MoMA. I encourage everyone to go and see it, um, make an appointment, um, and also to return next Thursday when we'll be welcome, welcoming Colleen Smith to the last event in our series. Um, Zimbardo also organizes a range of other platforms and projects, including the online series In Process and, and a number of other writings and publications. Meanwhile, Conrad Myers is a director, curator, educator, and advocate for experi experiential art. 
In 2011, he co-founded the Aggregate Space Gallery, an Oakland nonprofit video and installation gallery, screening facility, fabrication shop, and design studio. In addition to being director of Aggregate Space Gallery, Myers has also himself curated um, their lectures and other artistic conversations, film series, and been part of a numerous exhibitions throughout the region. Um, Jackie M. It, Jackie Imes serves as the Associate Curator of San Francisco Arts Commission Galleries currently, but she is also at the same time involved in a whole range of other organizations. She's co-founder and director of Et al. and um, Et al. Etc. in San Francisco. She's been at the center of a, a number of incredible initiatives in a, a range of art spaces and a number of publications, some of which we'll hear about today. Dorothy R. Santos is a co-founder of Refresh and our uh, fourth speaker today. Refresh is a politically engaged art and curatorial collective and she serves also as exec executive director for the Processing Foundation. Her writing appears in a range of publications and her podcasts have been circulated widely and her own artistic work has been featured in a range of exhibitions across the Bay Area and beyond. Together, everyone here, um, all of these individuals and organizations share a regional commitment, um, which is also to say that they carry, like UC Berkeley, an awareness our, of our region's political history as well. UC Berkeley and all of our Bay Area arts ecology is sited on the unceded and ancestral land of the Ohlone tribe, a placement whose politics is undergoing necessary, if belated, um, institutional redefinition on our campus and in a range of organizations throughout the Bay Area. Alongside that process here at our university then and elsewhere, I am especially grateful to have Art World colleagues like those that you'll hear from today who share in a commitment to aesthetic innovation, even as they simultaneously work to produce um, a an environment here that is both politically imaginative and ethically sustainable. So um, in a way that uh, propels a thriving life and a thriving work um, for all citizens of the region. So I'm thrilled to be focused here at home and thrilled to pass the screen to Tanya Zimbardo, who is such a leader in our region and will be leading today's dialogue. Um, so Tanya, over to you. Well, thank you, Shannon. Um, it's wonderful to be able to gather here today. It's been a long time since I've seen a lot of people in person and uh, just wanted to have this opportunity to gather with um, curators and arts professionals whose work I've deeply admired for years um, and also who have not only, I think, an important perspective to share with um, our audience today as well as the students about um, how to uh, create and produce opportunities for, for artists and for others, um, but also who have been deeply engaged in uh, creating conversations and seeing work and seeing other people's projects and spaces, some of which have closed in the intervening years. And so that perspective is something uh, that I think is really key for sharing in terms of understanding how the San Francisco Bay Area has been um, the epicenter of experimental media uh, for many decades now, rich histories of experimental music, of sound art, of experimental film, of video, uh, and it has been a place that has had museums in conversation with artist-run spaces, artist-centered organizations, residency programs, a wonderful array of schools, all who have worked together to make um, this a really vital contemporary scene and a real commitment on the part of artists to also have um, their work uh, in dialogue with um, spaces, artists, curators from elsewhere. I wanted to start with uh, this wonderful project by Lynn Marie Kirby and Christoph Steger, um, which for me 
represents a number of values that I um, appreciate in how artists think about where they cite or place work. Uh, this is a project that happened at the Alhambra Theater, which is now a gym um, in Russian Hill District. And it was a project that for me, um, having grown up just up the street, was really important to, to think about how you revisit this former movie palace, uh, which is now has another life, um, but that in this project, you had the sort of different audiences. You had the peers who were coming to see um, this event that was staged by the artists. You also had people who were working out. Um, there were intervened uh, into the space uh, and uh, different video projects by artists to the left one by Atel Adnan. Um, and then it was also a, a work that took the form of an app and of an ice cream social and really thinking about this neighborhood, which is Lynn's neighborhood, um, and a kind of history of both um, how we think of viewing cinema, a video, um, it also represents, I think, a sort of intergenerational dialogue that Lynn is a longtime educator and artist in this community has fostered um, in various ways and also has come from a generation of filmmakers who um, wanted to make sure that, uh, that there was a more pleasurable sort of viewing environment that as students, for instance, uh, being frustrated that there's sometimes limited opportunities and so how to create one's own um, and how to have a different kind of approach to experimental film. And a lot of the works that I've learned about and gravitated towards, not only because they may have a history of having been shown at the museum, um, including Al Wong's Twin Peaks, which is one of many examples that the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive are doing amazing um, preservation work. This is my own composite years ago when I showed this film. Um, but an artist and filmmaker who um, has always had an attention to light, but also as a San Francisco native and a long time um, being in this place, thinking about how to record uh, one's own environment, in this case, a beautiful year long film um, that Al shot uh, doing the kind of infinity loop around Twin Peaks at different times of day. Um, and this sort of uh, uh, kind of meditative um, pattern that's established in this work. And uh, I think a lot of us now during this period of the pandemic have been spending more time getting to know this place, uh, whether we have recently moved or gone to school here or whether we also were, grew up in this place. And a lot of the contemporary video work um, that I appreciate is also artists who are performing for the camera and are um, thinking about uh, landscape and specifically California landscape, even sometimes a connection with, um, you know, a place of, uh, you know, where else they may have grown up um, or, you know, in some cases a different country as well. Um, but the role that endurance can also play, um, but thinking about sort of the, the natural elements of a space as well. Um, and artists have also used video as a way to look at sometimes historical figures and histories of, um, of occupation of our relationship to the built environment and to California's specific history. We also have artists who have spent time here like Suzanne Lacey when during her tenure at um, CCA, who then years later on the occasion, in this case of a retrospective SF MoMA co-organized with Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, um, to use it as an opportunity to think of a really revisiting an extensive um, multi-year body of work with many collaborators um, that was staged in Oakland um, and often um, had in its moment media coverage. It had certain documentaries that were produced, but to really rethink it as a new video installation. And I think that with a range of spaces, I know with this survey, a number of the artists who've spoken so far in the series have um, sort of or maybe best known for large scale multi channel video installations in a kind of immersive environment, but that video can also take many different forms. And one of them is also the way in which uh, spaces have 
um, given artists opportunities to respond to even really specific architectural details, like this one at Interface Gallery, which was a wonderful show um, that had, you know, and sort of played with um, how certain aspects from the skylight to, you know, the corner situation of a, a room. Um, artists who have also thought about, you know, sort of what is a viewer, not only the, the people who may come into the space, but the idea of the passerby, someone who may not even know that they're experiencing so work. Um, in this case, Michael Dam, who also had founded in the 90s an important space called the Victoria Room. Um, this being a series of works, first a, a sort of collaboration between Invisible Venue and David Cunningham projects to have concurrent uh, presentations, and this is for a passerby commuter audience primarily, um, and then something he later then explored further with um, a residency program. The Bay Area also has just a really strong um, history of publishing and artists who are writing about the field within they that they work in, like Doug Hall or Stephen Wilson, um, but also a number of museum curators, art historians, and others who um, are revisiting and using collections as an occasion to learn much more about um, the work that has been produced here um, and the different networks um, that have been part of that. It is also a, a scene that has um, people using the occasion of an exhibition to produce, um, to self-publish or to give an artist an opportunity for a monograph or a zine. And so that is a big aspect of the work. Um, a lot of early video that we understand from this region also came out of intersections between art and technology in this case, um, the poet Joanne Kiger making an amazing video out of an opportunity for um, a television lab in which artists were invited to um, to use technology um, and to use television in a different way. So less about a focus on broadcast, although that is a kind of history as well in terms of artists producing content for that, but rather to use the technologies. And this is one example that um, the curator uh, Steve Side curated um, that was looking at a number of the key figures, um, the Vasulkas among others, Stephen Beck, um, who were using early technology um, and thinking about um, video space um, in, in a very radically different way than um, it had been uh, sort of an option at the time. And one of the roles of archives is also not only to preserve, but also to think of new ways to make this um, history come alive, including, you know, in this case, a live concert with the, the videola sculpture. Ant Farm um, being one of the key video collectives among others um, who were um, challenging uh, the, the kind of dominance of certain mainstream media and television um, and part of a group of artists thinking around uh, kind of a larger network of um, producing one's own uh, content, um, the scene that is sometimes also described as guerrilla television. And recently, Berkeley Art Museum has also had a wonderful online um, exhibition project around top value television and that history of um, artists making work um, using video um, at this era. Uh, in the Bay Area, we had a number of collectives, including Video Free America, which were giving artists opportunities to perform for the camera, to work in video, um, and that it also includes artists not from this place like Dan Graham um, and one of the sort of iconic uh, pieces of his. Artists who also, like George Bowling, um, were really critical not only for um, the, the role that they had in, in George's case, he was the videographer for a number of um, really important first generation conceptual artists and performance artists, um, such as Paul Cost, Terry Fox, Bonnie Shirk, um, 
uh, Howard Freed among others. And then he was also the first sort of institutional video curator here on the West Coast. Um, and so that that role that you know an artist can have in terms of um, being a sensitive uh, producer for another person's work, as well as then thinking of a kind of larger context for for curating it. Um, and this is just one example of sort of a work from that period that more recently was revisited um, as part of a kind of prologue to San Francisco Art Institute's current moment. Um, the founder of the performance video department, Howard Freed, in a very early studio performance. And the kind of thing that initially I have to admit, I was when I heard that they were um, projecting on the building that it was going to have drones capturing it and then you could listen to the audio on radio. I was skeptical that this wasn't sort of a traditional early video on cubic monitor, um, but this unfolded during the pandemic and was just such an amazing for me viewing experience of some work that I knew very well. It was part of a larger series of sort of foundational figures from uh, that department that has been um, really critical for producing and showing video and other time-based work. Um, it was curated by Tony Labatt, um, who is part of a sort of a student of Howard's and a younger generation that was also using video in some cases to document um, performance and sculptural actions, thinking of video as an extension of concerns of sculpture. And um, at the same time, also in different projects, thinking about how video can be shown, whether that is um, in a live uh, setting or a non-art setting, or if it is in fact con considering the kind of conditions of display of um, a traditional cube and, and uh, the sort of crate of work. And in terms of one of the first video installations I remember ever seeing and then was great to have an occasion to revisit it with the Art Institute was Doug Hall's um, large scale work thinking about the role of sublime in, in nature and has a very sort of distinctive Tesla coil element um, that is part of the work. We've also, as curators, um, often thought about how are there moments where we can work closely with an artist, um, not only to show their work, um, but to recognize that many of us may be also engaged or thinking about them. My colleague, Rudolf Freeling, spearheaded a wonderful initiative um, in uh, 2008 to invite a number of other Partners, New LinkedIn Arts, the Nonprofit Arts Center, um, Zero One, Berkeley Art Museum, De Young, um, Hess Collection, to all come together with our respective projects with Lynn Hirschman, Leeson, um, and to have it be a sort of distributed survey. So something that was looking at one case, how she was revisiting her archive that's now placed at Stanford in Second Life, but it was also looking at historical things she had done, like founding the Floating Museum in the 70s um, and being part of, um, not only as an artist, but as the director of sort of a space without walls, um, a scene in which artists, including Carl Loeffler um, of La Mamel, were thinking about um, ways of artists working at intersections of um, telecommunications, of video art, of correspondence art, and also publishing and publishing interviews being a key aspect of what they did. The museum SF MoMA hosted sort of retrospectives of these artists groups, um, Museum of Conceptual Art by Tom Marioni, Lynn Hirschman Leeson's The Floating Museum and La Mamelle um, as you know, three examples of very different approaches to, to running a space in that era. And then into the 80s, a number of um, artists and creators also wanting to think about other models than the sort of traditional nonprofit space to think about a commercial gallery or a space that may have also intersections with a music scene, performance scene, um, also groups that, um, you know, can, because of their proximity, can kind of promote their efforts jointly as well, um, as well as then in uh, left a publication that was part of a wonderful international, San Francisco International Video Festival um, that intersected with a range of spaces and that not only had a publication, but ultimately had a video gallery as just sort of one model of what a space could be. 
um, a number of uh, nonprofits from that period of the 80s, some of which have continued, like Artist Television Access, which has been critical for so many years in, in its different uh, versions and, and people who've been involved in really supporting um, the, the showing and the production of work, um, both in particular experimental film and with video as well. And um, some of the origin of that is also the kind of intersection or movement of certain artists who are coming out of an interest in electronics and custom electronics. Um, one example being um, Alan Rath, who a number of people will refer back to seeing this, this work in this kind of early moment. Um, for many of us, we've seen in a more commercial or, or museum context. Um, but the idea that um, maybe seem more common now, but for so many people to see work that really embraced a sculptural form that was also about electronics and, and using that as part of, not as a hidden aspect, but as the work itself, um, had an enormous influence on many artists, um, including Jim Campbell, who many of you may best know for his large scale commissions and, and public artworks, um, this being one of my favorite works um, because of its subject, Paul de Marinas, another key innovative figure. And here a work in which it's both using low resolution, um, but also it's, it's both a, a portrait of an, a fellow artist, um, but in the form of um, sort of the voice uh, as well as the visual. And so um, through a cycle um, changing, we're hearing Paul um, sort of different notes corresponding with pixels. Uh, and the new music scene um, and artists who are working in electronics has always been a really sort of key aspect as well as um, sometimes intersections with uh, live video or projection. This being um, an example of Pamela Z um, who has um, used uh, voice and relationship to gesture um, in a number of, of live works. And this being um, an example of a, a larger video installation that developed um, here in the Bay Area and has been shown since. Um, that is a 10 screen piece that comes out of a, a specific recombinant media labs um, cine chamber and the idea of offering artists a platform for thinking about sort of a 360 version of, of showing video. Uh, and a number of spaces like the lab that have been committed to a range of forms, but in particular sound and all of the expressions that can take um, creating a spaces for live performance as well as for sort of listening experiences. This being one amazing one, which is about uh, a kind of response to the, the former building of the Berkeley Art Museum um, here sort of displaced and experienced in a different way um, at the labs um, kind of phenomenal space in the mission. And, and artists have acknowledged each other um, and their influences, um, sometimes not through just curating um, or coming to each other's events, but also through sort of work that embodies that. And so this being two of um, a, a number of intention machines by Cal Svelitich, um that refer to different um, uh, key figures for him throughout his life, including Martha Wilson, who, um, with Franklin Furness, the, the sort of grant program um, has been influential for him as, as well as for so many others, in addition to other ways in which she's been um, such a pioneering figure. Artists also in um, running spaces in coming here have also offered, I think, other generations an opportunity to see work in a different context of how it was maybe originally shown and maybe outside of also just like a screening context. Um, so in this, just this one example of a group show that um, included this amazing video from Anne McGuire, whose work I remember being floored by when I first saw it as a graduate student. And so even if there's not a large like lapse in time, the ability to think about exhibitions as an occasion to 
um, to revisit and to share and to engage others in um, key works that have been produced, not only to think about just understandably the desire to premiere or debut new projects. And a lot of my favorite video works are people's early video works or works that, um, in this case, to wonderful sort of performance-based works for the camera in which um, sort of what is off screen as well as um, the idea of, you know, the, the loop of video um, being an aspect of um, the piece. But just for me, knowing that sort of artists can just also kind of produce work without it always being a kind of larger um, budget, uh, multi, you know, screen environment, but that the single channel video continues for many years, I think, to be a really vital form of production. Um, and someone like Desiree Holman, who um, has work, has also can span um, works on paper and uh, sort of performance-based video, and this being an example, a colleague at the museum had um, commissioned and shown in partnership with a number of other arts organizations um, in the Bay Area. And finally, Southern Exposure as I think not only a long-term um, artist-centered organization in the Bay Area, but has also been really critical in terms of their regranting systems through the Alternative Exposure Grant, that there's so many spaces and projects that are got that seed money from them, um, as well as then a, a commitment to having a curatorial committee so that there are artists um, who curate other artists who contribute to ideas of events and this being one um, project that stood out for me in the, in the way that it was also able to um, start from someone's ideas but then also to expand in terms of a number of other um, perspectives, voices that the, the sort of overall project was able to contain. Um, and of course, seeing over time artists like Horazawa, who um, their interests um, enfold with different uh, um, kind of source material over time. And in this case, more recently with um, this piece, National Anthem, that the Oakland Museum has acquired, as well as it was um, sort of premiered at the Whitney Biennial, um, responding to sort of um, current events and a media situation and allowing us to sort of see it and understand it in a different way. Uh, and finally, I think this moment of spaces also uh, revisiting and thinking in new ways or trying out what it means to show work online. Um, I was so thrilled that um, this work virtually Asian was able to have, I think like, even before this past weekend's um, New York Times coverage, I think it had like 5,000 views. And so to have work, um, have a, a way of being highlighted and shared more broadly um, and may have different lives in terms of how it is you know, shown in, in a physical space as well. And then um, just one of the heartening things for me also in this past year is seeing um, uh, curators find opportunities to continue some of the work that they've been doing in terms of conversation, but trying out formats like the podcast. And this was a series that Conrad had done um, that I appreciated tuning into, or in some cases going back to YouTube to watch. And so I thought um, that I would just end there and we could shift to Conrad um, to start talking about the work at Aggregate Space Gallery. Thank you, Tanya. Um, that's a that's a that's a great intro, actually, um, into kind of looking at what what the what the pandemic did to aggregates practice. So I'm I'm the um, co-founder and director of Aggregate Space Gallery, um, and Aggregate is a space that was um, you know, put together by my partner and I about ten years ago to to really just do um, large scale installation exhibitions. Um, and I'm really interested in uh, media exhibitions that have a, 
uh, a narrative element to them that that you as the viewer or participant as you move through the exhibition and move through the space and so um i i could talk about a lot of different things but i really wanted to just touch on a uh you know a half dozen of uh, our 60 exhibitions and uh so I, i'm going to show a lot of images and some video and talk a tiny little bit about um what uh what all that means to me so i'm going to start with um our uh second annual video open call so this was back in february of 2015 um uh this exhibition was called cringe and so the way our video open call works is we um we do just a blind open call and we rate all the videos blindly and i usually assemble a team of jurors that remain anonymous that work with me and looking at them and uh, we're about to launch our eighth at our new space which is why i wanted to uh, show this so this was our second one and um as the as the as we watch all the videos and rate all the videos um a uh a theme always emerges. And in this case, this year, all the videos were uh, artist self-portraiture and they all were um, disturbingly portraying the artist uh, as a um, person that rejects social norms or um, challenges their, what their, um, you know, what their, what their persona is. And um, the uh, so here's a, a, a brief walkthrough with no sound uh, that I shot on my phone back back in 2015 um, or 2015 rather. Um, so Keith Di Natale, Eliza Gagnon, Anna Garner, Kate Hample, Katie Hovenkamp, Lari Laura Hunjun Kim, uh, Monica Panzerino, uh, James Tantum, and Rachel Yurkovich, who was the artist that uh, had the piece Five Second Rule, where she ate the ice cream off the asphalt. Um, they all produced these works that um, lined up and made sense in conversation and so we displayed them that way um, and uh, we've done this on all the subsequent video open calls where the works have conversation with each other in the same room sometimes playing uh, with headphones sometimes if it had ambient sound those ambient sounds intermix and so that every moment that you're in these exhibitions um, is a new moment uh, and that hasn't happened before because they're all looping at different rates and the way in which you uh, move through the exhibition really kind of states your experience. Um, and that's uh, largely what I'm interested in when I'm working on um, these video shows. So the rest of the exhibitions I'm going to talk about are um, uh, solo exhibitions or group, group uh, artist collaborations. So um, in 2016, you partnered with um, the uh, podcast Kunstkapades, which runs out of San Francisco. Some of you may be familiar. Um, they host this bi-monthly art-based variety show slash podcast. Um, it's Josh Peeper, Tim Sullivan, and their trusty barkeep Marv. Um, they, it, it takes place in this fictional bar uh, on top of the Empress of China Tower in Chinatown, and it is a very weird mix of um, tropical and alpine descriptions of objects and things. Um, and so I really like the idea of us building this, um, uh, what they've talked about in an imaginary terms, uh, building it for real in our space. And so everything from the uh, tropical bar to the crashed gondola that they reference in every episode, um, we put a beach in the space. Um, and here's Sarah Hodgkiss. Uh, we did three live shows. And um, yeah, there's a KQED. Arts, di arts director, editor, Sarah Hotchkiss participating um, in one of the exhibitions. So um, later that year in 2016, we worked with Kate Short. Um, so Kate Short produced a piece called uh, Confluence and Kate came to me and said, um, you know, I I'd love to do something here, but it I'd like it to be really out outrageous, uh, really incredible, really take over the space. And her proposal involved six uh, 14 foot columns, um, carpet, blacking out the entire space so that you couldn't really even see what was going on when you entered the space. Um, and then each of these columns were filled with um, sonic um, vib vibration uh, uh, objects, a piece of technology that would make each of them hum at different frequencies. Um, and you felt it in your body. Um, Kate works with a series of subwoofers and a frequency that's beneath what you can hear. And so as you're in the space, it, um, it, it 
truly makes you feel like you're in a, experiencing something different. And this was in the middle of the summer. It took people 10 or 15 minutes to acclimatize to the fact that it was almost pitch black. These images in this video have been brightened uh, severely so that you can just see what's going on. And then you'll see some video of, of people interacting in the space. So I reached out to Kate, like I reached out to all the other artists that I'm talking about, just to kind of see what, what they would want to mention uh, or what they would want me to mention. And I'm going to read Kate's quote verbatim because it's, like, it's really beautiful. Um, Kate said, I feel like there's a thing that happens in the brain as it's trying to process what it's experiencing. When the brain doesn't know something, it is consistently working to find an answer. It's a primal need to be safe. When a person walks into a space expecting one thing and then finds something very different, the brain goes into overdrive, trying to put all the pieces together. Immersive spaces ask all the senses to be involved in this endeavor, to reconcile the experience. To me, the space in between not knowing and knowing is where the beauty of the experience lies. During that short moment in time, anything is possible. Um, so I'm gonna move on now to launch. Hopefully my screen is still sharing. Sorry about this. Um, so Shisi Huang, um, every year aggregate for quite a while would reach out to MFA, um, a group of MFA candidates and uh, offer them a solo exhibition right out of their MFA. So this is in October. Shisi had uh, graduated from SFAI earlier that year. Um, Shisi wanted to transform the whole space in a totally different way, only two exhibitions after Kate's, um, and proposed this emptiness of um, an exhibition. Uh, she was interested in light, space, the echoes of the viewers themselves, um, and uh, put a series of projectors and cameras that would reproject the viewers through prisms throughout the space, uh, creating these echoes that you would kind of search for where they were coming from, but almost could never really decipher it. Uh, the space was contemplative, it was dead quiet, um, and uh, absolutely incredible to be a part of. Um, in 2019, we, we hosted Richard Jonathan Nelson. Um, Shageg Sarus curated this exhibition. Um, Shageg was our longtime exhibition fellow, and uh, we got a little bit of grant funding to pay her to do some work, and one of those things was to begin curation. And, and Shageg reached out to Richard um, and who is a largely a textile artist, artist, but was dabbling in video. And he proposed this exhibition about the Anastatica plant, which is a plant that when pulled out of water uh, dies, um, but when you put it back in water, it comes back alive. And so he produced a incredible amount of videos. Um, I think there were 13 looping videos in the exhibition space, um, all running at once on different loops, generating this constant meditative state that, that just puts you in this feeling of, of life cycle, of time, of rebirth, all the things he was interested in that he did. Uh, Conrad, um, yes. Conrad, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but I think you mean to be screen sharing right now. And you oh. Been, oh, no. And Thank we've you been for that. Sort of, I've been texting you, others have been DMing oh. you, but. <laughs> Thank you so much for letting me know. Direct approach here. Okay, thank you. thank you very much. I'm so sorry. Uh, I'll just go back and just show a few images of, um, is that coming through okay? Hopefully that's coming through okay. Um, right now it's black. Oh, there perfect. we go. There we go. Thank you. Perfect. I'm thank sorry. Uh, I'll just go back through these real briefly. Um, I'm very sorry about that. It, it, it accidentally exited when I had to stop that video. Um, so uh, those were the images of Richard's uh, Exhibition. All of these exhibitions are available uh, to view on aggregatespacegallery.org if you'd like to take a look. Um, so Cadet Kuhn uh, is a largely works in two different practices, a sound practice and cinema practice, um, and uh, has been working a little bit in 2D and 3D sculpture. And uh, their exhibition, Null Extension, um, was a kind of an overwhelming inclusion of all of these factors and took advantage of our spaces, multiple screens. So we had at the time three permanent projection screens, one on each end of the gallery and one above. And uh, the whole space was wired for 5-1 sound. So Cadet took their practice of, um, you know, working through uh, the relationship between subject and viewer, inescapability, inescapability and endurance and potentiality 
and put this into lenticulars, um, multiple channel video, uh, and a two distinct soundscapes, one which occurred in the gallery and one, one which occurred in, for a different piece that was inside of our theater. Um, in 2019, we worked with Layla Weifer. Uh, we were able to get a lot of grant funding for Layla to produce this brand new work called Between Beauty and Heart, which was a uh, installation exploring um, uh, the nature of beauty and horror. Uh, it was a diptych uh, with a big long wall that divided the gallery into two. Here's a video we shot night out. Black. Lastly, I just want to um, talk out very briefly about Jefferson Pinder's exhibition, uh, Flashpoint, which still is online. Um, it was a, a, a partnership between Aggregate Space Gallery and SFAI when Aggregate Space had been displaced at the end of 2019. And um, Jefferson's work is, is even more important now. Um, he had, he had um, retraced a series of um, violent uprisings from the red summer of 1919. Um, and produced a series of work um, to commemorate um, some pretty awful atrocities. Um, to, um, uh, the surge of race riots, lynchings, and violent mobs that had happened in the South and in Chicago during that period of time. And so uh, you can go to uh, SFAI, SFAI's website and take a look at uh, that exhibition. Um, uh, and that's it. I think I'm going to pass things off to um, Jackie and Mel. Thank you again. Sorry for the uh, broken screen share. Hi, everyone. Let me just share my screen real quick. Do, do, do. Okay, um, so I am going to be a bit. Um, so this is a view from the top of the stairs of our Chinatown of at all's Chinatown space. Um, we opened that space in 2013. It's in the basement of a dry cleaners, and. Um, it's sort of a really it's a really good controlled <laughs> exhibition space we can. Uh, and it's allowed us to show a wide variety of works, including a lot of video works and um, any kinds of work that require a dark space because we can literally get it pitch black. Um, we also have a space in the Mission on uh, Mission and 24th Street, um, which is more of a traditional storefront gallery space. Uh, but uh, when we opened the gallery, we kind of called ourselves a, uh, commercial gallery that does projects, uh, meaning that uh, we, we're, we are a commercial gallery, we sell work or we try to sell work, um, whatever that means. And uh, we are, we're, but we're also really invested in artist practices and in uh, trying to be as artist centered as possible, seeing ourselves as collaborators, um, showing work that 
artists are interested in at that moment. Um, and we extend that same support to uh, independent curators who we've invited to show uh, curate exhibitions and projects with us. Um, so oh, first image is, um, this is an installation image from an exhibition called Sisters and Brothers from 2017. Um, we had invited uh, curator Jackie Clay, who is now the director of the Coleman Center for the Arts in York, Alabama. Um, this exhibition was, is of three early video works by Colleen Smith, Jaguar Mary, and Ayana Udongo. Um, Jaguar Mary is the, the um, projected image on the back. Um, so, because of the Chinatown space is relatively small, it's um, and it's uh, in the basement. We can we it's been sort of a fairly flexible space. We've built and torn down lots of walls. An artist has uh, created a hole in the back wall <laughs> for an installation. Um, a lot of things have happened down there. Um, we know that the in the narrow staircase you can get. It's just big enough to bring down uh, a sheet of drywall. Um, so for this exhibition, uh, Jackie was really interested in uh, showing work um, that represents Black folks and uh, is and was sort of an extension of her own thinking about like Black masculinity and Black femininity and uh, the sort of fluidity between those. And so this video exhibition, um, we had built a wall for the previous show um, for another light installation. And so it became conducive for us for a projected uh, piece. And then um, she also really wanted to emphasize the sort of video-ness of the of the works. Um, so we borrowed monitors. I think a lot of them came from the lab and some of them came from artists who worked on um, the art, uh, TV monitors uh, to have sort of like library of video um, that one can kind of like move from each piece down. Um, so here's a better view of the screening room. Um, and then um, as you can see, because it's sort of a, we have sort of this uh, bank of uh, fluorescent lights that so it's normally a pretty bright space, but for exhibition that require video or maybe if, we, for instance, in this two person exhibition um, from 2016, we have a video by Jackie Connolly, who uh, creates these sort of narrative videos in uh, The Sims. <laughs> And um, on the wall, we have drawings by uh, an artist, Brandon Drew Holmes. And so it, it allows us to kind of like play around lighting and how best to exhibit things. So um, going to get lamps and, or wall, wall mounted lamps for these show to specifically spotlight these without um, disturbing the video. Um, and similarly, we did sort of a similar clamp light um, situation to light the works in this show, which um, was curated by an artist, uh, Keith J. Verity, um, which and all the conceit of the show was that there was a series of video works by John Wilson, who has just had a show on HBO. Um, and uh, on all the other artworks were all by sculptors and he asked them to make sort of seating for this video work. So the sculpture by Peter Harkowick, Meredith Hillbrand, uh, Anne Libby, and Matt Siegel. Um, but it it allowed, I think for Keith, who's worked with us as an artist, um, he knew the, the space and he knew that a lot of the flexibility the space allowed for and um, how it, with the sort of like long space, it's really conducive to having a video work on like the back wall. It's sort of like theater-like in this very um, weird basement way. Um, we've done some, this is a show from 2019 by Hisu Kwan, um, and it was curated by Maddie Klett. And again, we have like a lot of playing around with different light sources, um, having a video projection, but also try to figure out creative ways to uh, exhibit the sculptural work that's in the show. It's a better view of the video work. 
Um, and because we're sort of really artist focused, um, we have sort of longstanding relationships with artists that we've worked with. Um, someone like Anthony DeSetta, who this was his first show, solo show with us in 2015. He's someone who early in his career was doing a lot of video work um, and eventually kind of did a lot of uh, sound work and uh, narrative sound work, and then eventually kind of into this realm of like things that's of work, of objects, of found objects and created objects that um, refer to a lot of the same concerns he's had with uh, video work and this sort of media consumption and um, sort of even like references to gothic horror or science fiction. Um, they're all the same things that he was concerned with with his video work. They're all very present uh, in these sculptural works. And I think it's sort of what we're interested in is this uh, evolution of his practice. Um, so this was his first solo show. And this was his second solo show with us at uh, at a space that we had at Minnesota Street Projects in 2017. Um, and what was funny, I was thinking about, you know, we were given this prompt of thinking about moving image. And uh, for this show in particular, all of the objects in this exhibition are uh, movie props. Um, so I think the this weird, this weird object thing, I think it was from like the remake of The Day the Earth Stood Still. Um, this basketball is from the movie Prometheus. And, but you don't necessarily know that coming into the gallery, they just all kind of seem like these random objects. But I think that there's like this really interesting uh, tension of, of these objects that have this sort of like movie aura, but then also this additional added aura of the artwork. Um, so there's like this really interesting tension there. Um, and I think I want to kind of end with another show of um, artwork that we did by someone who is uh, well known as a filmmaker, um, but we didn't show the films is um, artist uh, Kurt McDowell. This was an exhibition curated by Margaret Tedesco in 2018. Um, and Kurt McDowell was a filmmaker who kind of came up in the same group as like George Kuchar and Mike Kuchar, um, but he was also a pretty prolific artist and he was someone who has, had worked at the Roxy Theater and the Mission. And so, you know, these photos, this, these photo collages here are all photo collages from everybody, people he worked with at the Roxy. There's other photos or other works that we have where he did portraits of all of the employees at the Roxy Theater that would be up in the, in the Roxy um, in the lobby. And, um, and a lot of what we showed were works that, of portraits of all of his friends and his community and, um, and also props and posters that he had for his films. Um, so it was really not only a work, an exhibition of Kurt McDowell's artwork, but it was also this really poignant and sort of loving portrait of the, his community of filmmakers and artists and just sort of other kind of San Francisco weirdos, if you will. Um, so this was uh, like a casting call for one of his films uh, that was uh, with the screenplay, screenplay by George Kuchar. Um, I think in this picture, you can kind of see this, whoops, this is a um, prop where he, uh, like an opening shot of Thundercrack of the house that everything takes place in. And then this is like the credits, the end credits of one of his films. Um, but as you know, as I said, it was like, it was this really beautiful, portrait of this period of time and his peers and um throughout the exhibition it was just every like all of his friends names picked like multiple portraits of mike and his sister melinda and uh, and like this one his uh his portrait of george um so i think i'm gonna stop there and pass it on to dorothy
thank you so much. Uh, um, I'm really excited to be here with you all. I am Filipino American. I'm wearing a denim top. Um, I have clear glasses and behind me, it's a green tinted wall and, does, and um, kind of burnt orange armchair that I'm sitting on. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so everyone can see. Uh, and I guess I just could use a thumbs up from anyone that I can, that they can see my screen. It says Bay Area Media, Dorothy R. Santos. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and start. Oh, why is it not working? I'm wondering why that's not working. Please pardon the, no, oh, this is, hmm. Please pardon the technical difficulty. All right, here we go. Can everyone see that? Bay Area Media. <laughs> Let me just check. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. So uh, there is text on my screen. Uh, so I will be reading some of that. <laughs> and, um, and a lot of it is because I'm a writer. So I wanted to share that. Um, I wanted to share the first exhibition that I, one of the first exhibitions I co-curated, or actually, I'm sorry, that I curated solo with the Bay Area Society uh, for Art and Activism. I partnered with them. The dis, um, it, was, it was titled The Descendants, The Displaced and the Outliers. And unfortunately, I see that the image is not here. Um, but I partnered with them and we worked with the Electronic Frontier Foundation, Random Parts, Incline Gallery. Um, and the show was really challenging in the sense that I was asked to curate a show focused on security, digital privacy, and surveillance. So how was the subprime mortgage crisis, you know, affecting a lot of the um, like housing security for Bay Area residents? And what should be to everyone's right is actually a flyer. Let's see if I'm wondering if um, we're able to, oh my, my, I don't know what's happening with my slides, please pardon. This is very frustrating. We tested this out earlier. Um, is it a PowerPoint? No, it's actually Google Slides. Mm. So I, it seems like I'll have to describe everything, which is actually great because that's kind of what I do. Um, and if anyone does want to see the images, I'm more than happy to actually share them. It seems like they're not showing up. So my apologies for that. Uh, so in terms of my work with the Bay Area Society for Art and Activism, I worked with Elizabeth Travels Light. So we're just gonna, we're gonna switch it up because this is how we do it. Um, I worked with uh, Elizabeth Travels Light to showcase Bay Area based artists working with these ideas, um, which you can't see. <laughs> and, um, focused on these focus on these issues and it spanned in you know from uh, sculptural pieces to games to um you know one of the pieces that we had actually showed video uh of different spots within san francisco by eliza barrios uh, eliza o barrios that allowed people to learn a little bit more about the housing restrictions and regulations within their areas the second thing I wanted to talk about, because I do want to just be in conversation with everyone, is the Living Room Light Exchange. So uh, se season seven just concluded this past week, and I was a guest curator for season five. And throughout the seasons, um, we've had your, you know, being a part of the light exchange community is, you know, there have been speakers, artists, thinkers, curators, writers, such as Indira Allegra, Afro Surreal writers, Simone Bailey, Jer Jeremiah Barber, et cetera. You can see here, Lark BCR. I'll just read them off. Jim Campbell, Christy Chan, Rhonda Halberton, Abigail DeKosnick, and also Conrad and Willis Myers have also presented amongst many, many more, which you can view on the website. And the switch to digital was, um, you know, it was significant, obviously, in the past year with the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, because a lot of people missed being within a living room. But one of the things that happened with the digital, and if you think about it, you know, I, and I'm actually looking forward to getting into this in the Q&A, but the switch to the digital actually allowed many people from all over the world, not just the Bay Area, not just California, not just the US, but all over the world to tune in and listen to speakers 
um, from a Bay Area based and founded organization, which was really um, speak from that we're in ways that we we flex and kind of remain, uh, you know, agile, you know, within the arts community. And then there were publications, which again, if my images are not being shown, I can send them to you. You can view them on the Living Room Light Exchange websites, but the publications, um, they are on their fifth publication now, uh, the Living Room Light Exchange. And um, again, we can talk about that because it is an extension of the actual meetings in the living room. And now, the living, um, the 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 multiple living rooms that we're all meeting in through, uh, through Zoom. And the finally um, through slash arts digital room, and this is so interesting that the images are not showing up, and I'm laughing because a lot of this, thank thank goodness for for the the written um, portion of the of the slides, so I, we can talk about it a little bit more, um, and I can send and share links in the chat as well. Uh, but the last project I wanted to talk about was slash arts in the digital room because last year, again with shelter in place mandate, with a lot of the shows. Uh, from a lot of the universities and art colleges in the Bay Area not being able to show the work of their MFA students, Slash Arts uh, decided to uh, you know, launch a digital room as a response to continue the support for emerging Bay Area-based artists um, that are doing experimental projects and video work during the pandemic. Now, the works are featured on the digital room of the site, um, of the web, of Slash Arts website, and they're actually featured prominently on um, Slash Arts social media channels. So you can go back into their archives and, and search for these projects. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing because, and it seems like all those images can be seen now. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, if anyone also, I can make the presentation open just because I feel um, in the interest of time, I also wanna be in conversation with Conrad, Tanya and Jackie and Shannon uh, and all of you. So again, I can also um, figure something out on my end where maybe I can insert the link to the presentation and then you can view it on your own. Um, so yeah, I mean, I I apologize for for that. Um, I don't I don't know what happened, but thank you so much. Well, Dorothy, you were just a model of flexibility and agility of the Bay Area, right there. <laughs> Um, and also, as um, comments from students, including Annika in the chat show, um, all about addressing uh, accessibility, and we can even perhaps talk about what we do about the opticality and spectacle of time-based art and at the same time um, think about accessibility. Um, I just put your, your site into the chat for people to follow and fo go to other projects. You can do, I'll, 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 we'll start to populate the chat with more links um, that represent some of the incredible uh, people and organizations mentioned throughout this entire event. And, Casey and Edgar might help out with that as well. Um, but if you can make your presentation available, we'll work it out and perhaps even um, figure out in the final recording if we could add it, add it back in, but we'll see. Oh, that would be um, nice. Um, all, all just to say first though, <laughs> uh, um, and last, thank you. Thank you everyone for an incredibly rich, poignant, probing, rigorous excavation of the history of Bay Area video art and its lively present up until this, um, this moment now um, where uh, themes around the role of video art and the shift and pivoting um, necessary during COVID have all come up um, as topics throughout this entire series and all of you have um, offered some reflection about what it means to be working in this field at this moment as well. So up to the minute, ultra contemporary and also historically, um, you know, so rich. So perhaps um, I think uh, I just wanted to thank and uh, intervene here, but I'm gonna turn it back over to Tanya, who's our real um, leader of the dialogue uh, to, uh, for, to facilitate a few questions amongst the panelists. And we're going to turn to the rest of the audience in a bit. 
Um, thank you, Shannon, and thank you, everyone. It's you know it's really great to be reminded of um, a number of shows I've seen and different aspects of um, the work that the three of you have done, and also supported um, other curators and artists in doing. Um, being reminded of, I remember the first time seeing aggregate space and feeling like that the space that you had chosen at the time was able to really support um, not only media, but really like sculpture of a certain scale and sort of at the time a feeling that there was such a need for that. Um, or um, Jackie, the, the way that um, uh, that you guys have also been not only offering these um, important solo shows as well as group shows, but that there's been a real commitment to also having dialogue with a range of other spaces here, as well as sometimes exchanges that you've done um, with galleries elsewhere, or that sort of um, bridging between different scenes, which is so important. Um, and Dorothy, I'm also reminded with um, Living Room Light Exchange, but also with your work with Refresh, um, as a collective that um, in those moments where I experienced the exchange both in person uh, in salons as well as virtually, um, but that there was for me um, a real sense that uh, on one hand it was a part of a conversation, but that it was also doing something that I was missing. I think sometimes you guys used to have an intro that was like, this isn't just blinky blinky light art, or I mean, maybe I'm watching that, um, but that there was a certain kind of conversation among artists that wasn't necessarily always having, especially when a lot of conversation around tech is dominated by courting um, donors. Uh, and so that creating spaces for peers to have more in-depth conversation about also work in progress um, felt so important. Um, so I guess I was just wanting to when I think back to when you first started the decision to create a space or a series, um, what some of that idea of like, what were models that you were looking at and also what were things that you felt maybe didn't fit that you wanted to shift in a different way in terms of, you know, either the decision to be commercial or nonprofit, the kind of physical space you were thinking about and maybe even just location of in proximity to other spaces, let's say in Oakland or in San Francisco. I'm happy to dive into that for as long as you guys let me talk about it. <laughs> um, I, so we, uh, I mean, our space was built largely for the exhibition of, of, of video. I mean, we, we got our hands on a, a empty warehouse and the landlords were very, at the time, uh, supportive of anything that we would do in there to liven the space up a bit. Uh, they had some really bad tenants previously. And so we, they, they kind of let us, they encouraged us to do whatever we wanted to. And, and we, um, we built some walls and they're really just to separate space and then started to really see that it could be an exhibition space. And, and I think our inspirations were largely what we weren't seeing. Um, at the time, Southern Exposure was between locations. They were building their new venue. And um, I think uh, New Langdon had just closed and um, we were, we were, we just wanted to see big projects by emerging artists. You know, I mean, I think it was, we had a lot of friends that were making art and we saw them stopping because there weren't venues that, that supported it. And so at the beginning, it was just friends uh, and shows and it seemed like a really cool idea. And then once we kind of started to, once I, you know, more, more than anyone else really started to love the idea of telling that story, we just continued to outfit the space. So, you know, I mean, if you look at our early shows, the, the space doesn't look like it did at the end. We, we were still building walls and we were still adding speakers to the ceiling. and. I think we had retrofitted the theater maybe three times over, like I would do it over Christmas break and, and like buy a stereo that was on sale at Best Buy and then change all the speakers out and kind of up, update it to, to fit. And um, we, that I think um, we were just an artist run space for four years. We didn't become a nonprofit until 2015. So, um, and that was a process that we did because of alternative exposure. We, we were actually able to uh, pay that portion of our rent for a year and we brought on some interns, um, which which was the beginning of our what became our exhibition fellow program, which is ongoing. Um, but we we brought in some people to kind of sit in the gallery on Saturdays and Willis and I just worked on paperwork and filed stuff and built a board and asked people if it was the right thing to do. And 
Um, just to answer one of the earlier questions about do artists get paid, um, none of the people got paid at aggregate at all um, until 2018. So we had been open six years, something like that. Um, and then when we, when we started to get um, grant funding, which is one of the reasons we became a nonprofit, that money went right to the artists. So uh, uh, you know that culminated with the Andy Warhol Foundation, which was $90,000 for two years, which guaranteed every artist that showed in our space a $2,000 check, and it paid for artist staff um, and and made sure and you know there was an installation budget, um, and you know that that um, we had an NEA grant which we used for the same thing. We used that for Toria Cummings show and Jefferson Pinder's exhibitions that we were able to fund those with $5,000 each. And so, um, you know, it's, it's contingent on if, if we get grants, that money goes to artists. It's, it's not a hard sell of a equation. Um, and, and I've been mostly a volunteer uh, since the beginning. Um, although when we do uh, get some grant money, I sometimes take a bit. But um, uh, for the most part, we're, we're really just trying to get people enthusiastic uh, and to, to not leave the Bay Area and to feel like this place can ha house the exhibitions that their MFA has taught them to make. You want to go, Jackie? I can go. <laughs> I guess. Um, <laughs> go ahead. I mean, just to echo what Conrad has already stated, I think that's to go back to the more of the models question. So yes, absolutely 100% plus one to uh, supporting Bay Area based artists. And I think the models that, you know, I learned from when I was working with Elizabeth Travels Light for um, and with the Bay Area Society for Arts and Activism, I that was really kind of my first foray into what it means to run an organization. I feel I wouldn't be I wouldn't be I wouldn't be running processing foundation if I didn't have that experience and a lot of that is based on this agility to you know find funding find the community and yesterday I was watching something it was like I really love um, Ocean Vong and I was watching his 2019 NYU talk and he said you know I think a conversation between him and Monica Sook another writer where community only takes two people so you start building from there and I think that is, um, maybe it's also my stubbornness. I'm born and raised in San Francisco. I think in a lot of ways, I, I no matter what changes happen within the Bay, I, I will always love the Bay Area despite it all. And, you know, and I think it, you know, it helps to, you know, with every iteration of work that I do within, whether it's refresh, whether it's working with and partnering with Slash Arts, it's also understanding how I can give back in the little ways that I can. Um, very similar to Conrad, as soon as, where the organizations I work with are able to give money to artists, that's really where it goes. But there's a lot of behind the scenes work, a lot of invisible labor that goes into making um, what I'm certain Jackie and Conrad and Tanya um, see in uh, so much of the work that they do. So, you know, I, you know, I, I, I want Jackie to say more and I know that there's more to talk about and there's so many things in the chat, but I just wanted to quick, you know, quickly throw that in. Yeah, so I think we're um, so like as I was saying that like at all is commercial, but it's also like a project space because for so many years, like it, there was like this comment saying that I kept hearing from people who run commercial galleries where they're like, "Oh, it takes five years for you to become like successful," and in our experience, it's a little longer than five years, um, and so we're we're kind of like we're we're sort of we don't want to take the sort of route of show of like pressuring artists to show work because we know it can sell or show make the kind of work that we think we can sell we're pretty we're very much like you're going to make the work and we're going to show it and if we can find the people who are excited about the work that you're making we we're going to sell it we're going to uh sell it to them we're going to be supportive and we're supportive in like other ways outside of like sales like we will pitch in for supplies and for installation costs and things like that um and like i think the reason we went commercial was sort of weirdly arbitrary <laughs> to a weird extent like i think I, I i have a lot of experience working in arts nonprofits and i didn't know if i really wanted to go that route and uh and it's sort of i just i had bad experience with like having a bad board and things like that and I was just like I don't know let's try something else let's 
let's try this other route. And um, I don't know if it's worked yet. <laughs> you know, it's still, we're still learning. We're still like, we're still trying to figure out how to be an ethical business, how to uh, be ethical to the artists that we work with, how to be uh, in community with folks in the Bay Area, but also with galleries and artists who are national or international. So it's just an ongoing process. And I think with a lot of media also coming with, um, you know, there's opportunities to to work closely with artists to produce something for a space, but I know it can also be for a lot of independent curators also just a barrier if, you know, how to afford equipment, especially anything more specific, in addition to the point that was also raised about artist fees. And I know, you know, for myself at times, the comfort level I have with independently showing experimental film, but you know, working on an AR app, I, you know, like I don't even know how I would get a grant for that. And so just that kind of um, challenge that I think a lot of people encounter is being interested, but how, how can you, if not have the physical space, like what are the other kind of resources? And certainly there are a lot of great um, residency programs, some of which have also historically and more currently have, um, you know, brought together um, sort of art and, you know, tech industry um, as one model. Um, also, sometimes the way I've seen with galleries, they, you know, work with not only collectors and, and consultants, um, but sometimes that there's also people who've come forward and say, you know, I don't want to live with this work, but I support this artist and I'd like to, you know, make sure that, you know, I can help the museum with a project or, you know, some space. And so I think all of us are sort of navigating these, these different models. And, and I know for <clears throat> when I think of some spaces in the past, like Jasmine Moore has wonderful crow's work, which was a neighbor of Conrad's, um, you know, a, a, a project that was specific to photography and video initially, and then expanded to painting, but, you know, was intended to be commercial. Um, but that was also able in its vision of programming to to not just have like, okay, you have to be on my roster and it has to be a certain kind of work that sells. And um, so I've been interested in just also how um, curators and directors of spaces have thought more expansively of like, what, what can we show even if we are trying to occupy supporting artists through a commercial um, project. Uh, and it also seems that there's in terms of just like audience and building audience that there's a lot of partnerships that are happening. I'm thinking more recently of um, the Eight Bridges, but also I know Conrad with Oakland Art Murmur and other initiatives over time. Um, is that something that you seek out in terms of your spaces or does it come out of other kinds of conversations? I'm happy to uh, talk to that a little bit. I mean, I think the Oakland Armour was out of a desire to kind of get us on the map at the beginning. And when the more I got to know them, the more I, I realized that this is something I, I care about and I want to stay around. And I got very involved to the point I was the board president for a little while. Um, and it it's um, it's exhausting work because it's not, um, you, you know, in, in, a, in a city like Oakland, everything's kind of against the grain. There's not an arts council. Uh, and there's not really arts funding for organizations. And if there was, there are so many that need that need money um, that, you know, that, that you know, they, they periodically have like thousand dollar grants or five thousand dollar grants and, and they're, they're, they're quite small. It's not like they're paying for major projects. They have some, um, you know, more uh, public art budget than they do for kind of spaces. Uh, but the Oakland Art Memorial, you know, they, they made this great relationship with um, a bunch of uh, commercial leaseholders. And so Aggregate has an up, a project that's up on weekends at um, 4750 Telegraph, where we have a dual channel rear projection that is just right on the front of windows, um, right on um, Temescal Avenue. And uh, that was that came out of that relationship. But again, it's, it's a, uh, they have empty space that they're giving to us. Uh, we had to budget for the technology that we had to purchase to run the equipment. And I have two projectors that have blown bulbs twice already since it's been up a month ago, you know? So it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's, um, it's 
the arts itself aren't being funded, but they're being supported through um, real estate, which is, I think, the, the base of what's necessary. You know? And and our new space um, is like under construction. I almost hosted this from it, uh, but it's just a tad too under construction. Uh, we're in the process of, of repainting it and kind of bringing it up to uh, a uh, an art exhibition standard um, from where it was previously. And I, I absolutely cannot wait uh, to show that to everybody. And, uh, our first show is going to be a video open call, and um, it's going to be it's going to be really special. It's um, we're really lucky to have uh, great landlords that are extremely supportive. So exciting! Well, I can talk a little bit about like the kinds of partnerships we have. So, um, for our when we had a space at Minnesota Street Projects, a few of our exhibitions were sort of these split exhibitions, where like one half of the gallery was an exhibition that we organized and the other half was um, a, an exhibition organized by a gallery that was from outside of the Bay Area. So we've had Cooper Cole, which is in Toronto, uh, Queer Thoughts, which is in New York, uh, Yachtepec, which was in Mexico City, um, and so on. And so, um, those sort of came out of this uh, conversations that we would have with our sort of peer galleries that we would that we would kind of meet up with, um, and a lot of these took these conversations took place during like art fair season. So we would be in a, at a fair, and it has this weird. If you've ever worked in art fair, like like Nada or any of the other bigger fairs, it has this weird sort of summer camp vibe where. You have you're like in close proximity with people that you don't necessarily see uh, all the time, but but you have like this sort of really close camaraderie, and everyone's sort of commiserating with each other about like the bad fair food or expensive drinks or things like that. And so it it all kind of uh, came out of these conversations of like galleries who were trying to figure out ways to get their artists work out in the world that wasn't just kind of their own community, but trying to figure out ways to connect to different communities. And so that kind of came out of that, of just this desire for on our end to want to show lots of good work <laughs> and that's sort and it, you know with it's uh kind of led to like why we have two spaces why we have china tanish in right now is because we're pretty, we're stubborn we stubbornly want to show as much work as possible in the in the short time time frame that like an exhibition within a year like an, how many exhibitions there are in a year like we want to show as much art as we can and um and so, you know, we don't have these sort of like collaborations, but we still do, like we're still like working with other galleries or working with other uh, curators um, for like, we talk to them all the time and we hope we'll host shows and things like that. All right, uh, incredibly rich and we only have a couple of minutes left. Um, so perhaps um, we can turn to some of the questions that came up in the Q&A section of Zoom, as well as those that are also um, in the chat. Um, so, um, Tanya, would you like to um, address sure. Marcella's question? Yeah, so there's um, questions about, um, and great comments that have been made also about the potential of online spaces and online and virtual exhibitions and series um, and especially as an alternative to physical spaces in places like the Bay Area that can be prohibitive in terms of um, gallery real estate. Um, just curious if you guys have perspectives and maybe even how that has changed and more recently about how you see the work of online. I can start there since I, <laughs> um, I've been working a lot with, um, you know, artists, different artists through Processing Foundation. I know that there is one uh, online show that is happening right now that is being organized by Transfer Gallery. Um, it is California based, but um, I wanted to speak to the different types of ways that work can show up online. I did not want to bring this up. So please forgive me, but I'm bringing it up. But a lot of a lot of the questions I get are around NFTs. 
So these kind of non-fungible tokens and how that works with um, digital artwork. And, um, and, and, and the reason why I'm bringing it up is because NFTs also include uh, GIFs or GIFs, however you want to pronounce that. So moving image as well. And that type of economy that is still being, I mean, right now it kind of feels a little bit like the wild, wild west, which is a consideration that we need to take when, you know, the more logistical things like, you know, convert dollars to Ethereum. It's, it's a really um, interesting space right now. But again, I bring it up because once we're able to meet in person, the, I have more questions than I do answers. Like how would that affect how new media and digital artists are then shown in physical spaces? You know, that's a kind of consideration that I'm thinking about. So pardon me everyone for having more questions, but I also say that because, um, you know, it's important to, to think about uh, new media and digital work in terms of a genealogy as well. I mean, it's been around for decades, but with the pandemic, it almost seemed uh, more hyper amplified and visible because everyone, I shouldn't say everyone, many people thought that there could be this kind of one-to-one -one direct translation of digital works or media works onto the into the online space. And I think as Marcella pointed out, there are, it's not just prohibitive, prohibitive in IRL spaces, but a lot of it too is, you know, um, how, like, what can you show in physical space? Like Conrad, you know, with, with aggregate space, that's just such a great example that there are certain works I need to be embodied. There needs to be that embodied experience. So that's also a consideration that I, I hope moving forward. And I, I hope I'm also answering a, a few of the questions that I saw regarding what's this new direction. You know, um, I do really pull, wholeheartedly believe that the Bay Area, despite all the changes, is going to remain agile. Um, and thinking through uh, different types of ways to be not only accessible, but inclusive. I think that's something that definitely needs to change when um, we go back to visiting these new, uh, when I say new, um, these kind of seismic shifts that we've all experienced culturally, socially, and politically. So um, that's, also, that's also the work that I would wanna see new media artists tackle is um, environmental, social, cultural issues um, uh, that, you know, really kind of, and I know that's been done for decades, but what I mean by that is um, stuff that maybe can't become an NFT. I'll also just say with online exhibitions, um, it's just been interesting to see the range um, from how it impacts experimental film community to, um, you know, the potential of actually a lot of video work that was never meant to be shown online or just not wishing it to be shown, um, that there's been certain people who have, depending on a certain circumstance, considered it in a way that they may not have before. Um, I also know that there's, you know, just a history here in the Bay Area, a little different of um, artists who are creating work specifically for the internet, some of which has now been retired, um, but that a lot of venues, uh, and I remember when um, spaces, I, I want to say, I forget if Southern Exposure did, New Langton Arts Museums like SFMOMA had certain online gallery portals that we were experimenting with, um, but when there was the dot-com bust, that the funding for a lot of that online wasn't there. Um, a lot of institutions also much more focused on getting people into spaces. And so I think it's always been a challenge, especially even in the field here where a lot of the um, uh, recognized work goes to artists who are making essentially time-based media sculpture or they're making um, work that has a sort of real physical presence. Um, but there has been a lot of creativity, um, I think for years, and, and Lynn earlier, um, Hirschman Leeson as someone who's like, well, let's explore how I revisit my archive in Second Life, also still doing shows and installations, but that, that can be a way to think about it or, um, you know, seeing more recently galleries, which have been like, let's, you know, try this out, uh, having a show in a gallery, like, you know, um, a game virtual chat room, or let's use this essentially real estate software to explore spaces. And I've just been excited by the fact that I can see and have a lot more dialogue with people who may not have shown up in person to an event. And I think that's something we also take into consideration that there's a lot of us who spread out in the Bay Area to Vallejo and Sonoma, you know, like 
so that's a reality, but there's also this sort of Bay Area art diaspora that happens when people go to move away and take teaching jobs, et cetera. And so Zoom is still, I think for me, I'm pretty enamored by the fact that we can have these kinds of conversations, um, even though I miss the in-person. And so I think online exhibitions is something I am still hopeful for. And that also, I think when it comes to screening work, there's just certain work that doesn't make sense in a cinema. And so maybe the online space is a space for showing like performance video, for example, um, or documentation that doesn't have the pressure of a, a physical show. Tanya, that was, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. Um, I maybe can jump in with like, maybe like sort of a counter. Like I think we, when, I think when, the shelter in place man it uh, came up I it was sort of a weird relief to have a break of like and I uh, and I think with being on zoom, on like zoom and like in meetings all the time for for work I have like I have this like reaction like it's sort of like I uh, negative reaction to events online because I was just like no that's enough I'm done um like after after a day of work a day of being on meetings and um so I I there was like this weird thing where we were there were a lot of like sort of online art fairs and we would get invitations to do this and I we did a couple but it was always it always just seemed absurd right to have this exclusive online art fair and it's like it's just a URL it's just a URL, guys. <laughs> um, so it's, and like, it's just like JPEGs on a screen. And so it always felt like really absurd. And so when we last, like early last uh, spring, summer, we kind of were like, all right, let's push this to the absolute extreme. We hosted exhibitions in Animal Crossing. <laughs> And we had like a video, like we had it set up where we had uh, a computer filming uh, the Animal Crossing world where and I built a gallery in my little Animal Crossing house and we had a Zoom opening reception because we were just like, this is, this is all absurd. This is all surreal. We're all in this weird nether space of like Zoom rooms and uh, not being able to see art because all the galleries are still closed and all the museums are closed. So uh, let's try to hang out at least and let it be weird and I can change little outfits <laughs> in, my zoo, in my Animal Crossing and visit my neighbors but also still like look at this weird JPEG art that's like tinier than what a digital art fair was and just kind of like push that to the total extreme. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Jackie. And thank you, Tanya, too, for and Conrad for the um, the last round of disquisitions uh, responding to the onlineness of everything, which also I think tacitly is addressing Susan Joyce's question about new directions for how we place art and also the skepticism along the way. Dorothy, thank you for the comments here that you're providing in the chat that um, that you know that in many ways this how how people are handling the um, onlineness of everything or using real estate programs as artistic material or all of these different manipulations are perhaps part of the genealogy of re-inhabiting and hacking space uh, that from the very beginning Tanya shared with us in her opening uh, history of, of the Bay Area video art history. You can think about all of the different ways that um, video artists in the Bay Area occupied space in um, creative um, and unconventional and eccentric ways. And you could say that this is part of the ongoing genealogy of that experimental practice. Um, there are um, almost 90 people who've stuck with us past the end of this event. Uh, I wanna thank you for staying with us um, and being part of this conversation. But most importantly, I wanna thank our panelists, um, Tanya, Jackie, Conrad, Dorothy, such luminaries, such committed advocates, um, such in the trenches workers, um, and such um, uh, uh, out of the box experimenters that um, we're also grateful to have in our ecology. Thank you for your time today. Um, thanks to everyone for joining us. You're getting thanks and gratitude in the chat. Um, and look forward to our last program on Thursday with Colleen Smith. I uh, hope you'll join us. Thank you. Thank you. Great.